Timmy D, Timmy Duncan, you know what I'm saying? Uh, top 10, for sure, a top 10 talent, but nothing above top 10. He will never be top 5, he'll never be top 3. My reason because of it, even though it doesn't really, like, uh, it's not his fault, he's just put in an amazing situation at an amazing time. That's why I have him and Bill Russell, like, in the same category. Um, the great player, though, that, that has nothing to do with it. Definitely the key to all of their championships. But let's just get straight to it. Why Tim Duncan was one of the best ever. Before we get started, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Help me get to 360. We are five away. Round of applause, round of applause, because we've been, we've been rolling, like, let me just put this into perspective. We have been rolling through these goals like nothing, my brother. You know what I'm Let's just keep that up. Let's get this vid to a cool five likes. You know what I'm saying? Five likes, I think we could do that. We Also, we've been doing very good on the like button. Let's just get straight to it, my brother. In brethren. this series, we've seen two types of big men. The first anchored the defense while playing a kind RP, of co-pilot role Watson. on offense. The second dominated with their team's attack orbiting around their incredible scoring. Which brings us to the final great big man in this series. Was Tim Duncan more of an offensive centerpiece? That's or tough. did his crafty low post scoring game and suffocating interior defense make him the very best of the two-way big men? Bird and all this. Has it blocked by Elijah Ross? Michael Jordan the day. This series tackled one question. Oh Who was God. the best at his best? We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches, examining the legends who provided the most on-court impact. These are the greatest peaks. Timmy Tim, Timmy will hit you in phrases. Got you. Ooh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> this the worst right here. Nice try. Duncan is easily the best modern defender never to win Defensive Player of the Year. His teammate Bruce Bowen Seriously? is actually the only player with a larger share of votes over the years to never claim the award. And like great defensive centers before him, Tim's value comes from protecting the most important he real estate never, in the game, the space right in front of the hoop. I've never seen any public record of his actual wingspan, but Duncan was long. He was around seven feet without shoes. Oh! Duncan was long. He used to get like he was that? Around seven feet without shoes what? and had the arms of a weeping willow tree. Wow. This is one of the reasons he blocked so many shots out of a shooter's hand. He had great feel and timing when targeting attempts like this. Kenyon Martin is auditioning for the role of Charles Smith here yeah, like, until what are you Kevin doing, bro? Willis like, pass the ball. foul. Like, what are you and doing? Here, Devin George is overcome with the wild idea to baptize yeah. Duncan. And notice Timmy used that so off arm again to the role players. George and always. the block. Timmy. This time it's Rob Ori trying him. And Duncan takes a big step and again uses his off arm to brace against him, and that swimmer's reach oh can do the rest. God. His strength Always helps this place. style of shot contesting Always. because he doesn't need to load up to jump. Yes. He plows through his man here and probably catches Kobe by surprise. And yeah. the big fundamental likely caught plenty of shooters off guard because he kept his hands down when he moved, then typically brought them up when jumping like this. So he was always under control when sliding over to help in the paint. This steady body control allowed him to challenge threats in the lane and then immediately recover into a second challenge, which is one of the perks of a more floor bound approach because he never jumped himself out of a play. Again, you'll see his hands are down, ready to jump, but he stays locked and loaded and his windmill arms meant he could swivel from one threat to the next because his rim protection was less about leaping and more about timing and that ent-like standing reach. Duncan's block percentage during the playoffs in these seasons wasn't too far from the all-time greats, 
although his numbers were suppressed slightly by playing next to another center. When the Spurs went Twin Towers, there was about a 15% reduction in his block rate. Who cares? Of course, keeping his hands down and not out meant he rarely deflected passes, and that made it a touch easier to slip them around him. Another key to Duncan's paint defense was his positioning. He'd sag into the lane an extra step or two, so he didn't have to go far to meet penetrators. Again, note the body control to stay down, and he barely needs to jump to swat it. He could stand one step into the lane using the classic toe-tapping technique to avoid three seconds, and that cut down the distance to help off the weak side. Here he slaps his hips in disagreement, a rare move in a deep bag of protestations, some of which were more animated, and some of which were more subtle performance art. Although, my personal favorite is the incredulous stare. I'll bet you money on that one. I'll talk I don't bet anything. I'll go for a hamburger. I'll bet you a hamburger. You got it. Speaking of <laughs> reactions, Duncan's weren't always lightning quick. George is free here before he goes, but he's so well positioned it takes one step to Yeah, protect. the vibe I get though, hmm, I could be wrong, but this is the vibe I get. I low-key feel like ISO, he's he's a liability. Or he he his his yeah, like he he he's more so dominant when it comes to like how do I say this? He's more so dominant when it comes to help defense rather than you see it on maybe, maybe I'm wrong. The rim and there was usually a tiny delay before he started sliding, and the third time was not He's the better at help defense. TD usually arrived on time, but sometimes that minor delay in reaction speed led to a bucket. But he also didn't need nanosecond processing because he was such a big presence. And he quick step toward the ball handler, heavily influenced drives. He was even long enough to throw off floaters from skilled guards. In My recovery. general, Duncan was aware of most threats. After some creative screening, he slides toward the action here, then realizes he needs to help on the roll man, and that is a tough hey, make. Watching the three. Here's another storm of ball screens by the offense, and he plugs up the first roller realizes he needs to recover to the second screen and smothers the ball handler in a great team sequence. Duncan was part of a unit that choked off opponents at the rim, holding them well below league average on these high value attempts. The Spurs were most successful with two centers out there, but even with Duncan as the lone middleman, they defended the paint incredibly well and in general thrived behind a defensively oriented roster. This is also where Greg Popovich established himself as an all-time coach, throwing in a zone every once in a while to throw off opponents, and instilling airtight schemes. The Spurs switch this pick and roll because Amari Stoudemire is mismatched with a wing, then Duncan can pick up Amari behind the play, and Manu Ginobili is down in a driving gap and the whole thing's a clinic. Play recognition. The consistent implementation of these principles was impressive. A big shows on the pick and roll here, which means the other big in the paint slides to cover the roller, and wings were always prioritizing paint help. Bruce Bowen is sealing inside Duncan's man, and then the rotations quickly follow, and it leads to a low percentage shot. With Ginobili and Tony Parker yet to enter their primes, Ooh, that Spurs roster he he was made that. Ginobili and Tony Parker yet to enter their primes. Why? That Spurs roster was lighter on offensive parts, and instead featured defensive studs like Bowen and an aging admiral, who had his moments in spurts. All of this made the Spurs a defensive dynasty, posting some of the best multi-year stretches of regular season and playoff defense in league history. San Antonio's defense was practically elite without Duncan, holding teams nearly four points below league average from 2001 to 2004 with him on the bench. With oh, Duncan protecting the paint bad. as an anchor, the Spurs became an all-time defense, and he had the ability to plug up breakdowns with fantastic saves. So yeah, this. that's that's the vibe I get. Whereas what KD, KG, check out my uh, video before this, with KG, it was more so like he was just everywhere. Like 1v1 play recognition. I low key got KG over him defensively. I'm not going to lie. 100%. With him, it's more so just like play recognition. And his responsibility isn't as big as KG's because he had 
a hell of a team. You see what I'm saying? So there wasn't many holes on his team to fill. Whereas with KG, he was just doing that because the, the team depended on his defense like that. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah that's my thing. However, he did have some blind spots in his He's vision. just really good Maybe at play recognition. He could always locate the ball instantly or anticipate danger at all times. He just completely misses this slip play yeah, that I would, I would like say to bust KG, out on 100%. occasion. 100%. And he could have a little tunnel vision while on Comment down below if you agree. This cut isn't really going anywhere, but he zones out and misses the back door. And this is almost identical to a play from last episode where Robinson helps in front of Duncan, only Tim doesn't slide over to cover Robinson's man until it's too late. Yeah, and there's KG no wouldn't make that a mistake. Only way KG would make that mistake is if he's advocating for somebody else's mistake. That's where a lot of his mistakes lie. Like he'll he'll be forced to to do a, a crazy gamble or some shit like and leave somebody with a with a deep two or some shit like that because one of these bum ass niggas made the mistake of doing so by leaving their man you see what i'm saying whereas Don't him he more so his responsibility isn't as big these spurs pick and roll scheme reasonably well showing then recovering to his man but he was particularly effective sagging off the dribbler and then using his length to bother pull up jumpers even far out on the perimeter, his never-ending arms caught shooters off guard. And since he was mobile enough to venture out a bit and use that size to keep ball handlers at bay, he was well-suited for sagging, dropping coverages against pick and rolls. His lateral movement wasn't really a strength, at all. and he was slightly vulnerable slow. on the outside to quickness. On this play, he's KG supposed would to slow never. the ball but the sharp change of direction leaves him in Kobe's wake, and that whole Twin Towers thing was him. so effective. So he still, he still has holes. Now, while Duncan's mobility wasn't great, he was slow to decelerate, for instance, he wasn't a liability moving around the floor during that era. While he could be beaten by quicker players when guarding the ball, it was rare for big men at the time to face up on the perimeter yeah, and true. attack him with speed off the bounce. But, let me, last time pausing, but when we talking about greats, shit like that counts. You see what I'm saying? So he could never be the greatest defender of all time. KG has an argument for that. I'm not going to lie. Like, KG low-key could, could be the greatest defender of all time. I think it's if not going to lie. The slower, more interior-based game amplified some of TD's man defense, where his length could really bother opponents who couldn't stretch him to the outside. He was also really strong, strong enough not to be completely manhandled by Shaq himself. Of course, that didn't work every possession. I'm convinced flopping was the only way to actually Tough. slow down O'Neal. So just like we've seen from most of the big men in this series, Duncan's defense was an enormous value add. The bigger question though, is just how valuable was an offense run through Tim Duncan? When you have rheumatoid arthritis, the smallest things can feel like the biggest obstacles. I know that bank shot, that's his money. Tim Duncan. Your town. The week of greatness is back at Foot Locker. No way. Damn, I forgot that's D insane. Rose had his own shoe. I'm off the wall. I never guess this exciting. Everybody, bro, everybody used to want those, bro. Damn it. In contrast to the guard like approach we saw last episode from Kevin Garnett. Duncan's offensive game was rooted deep in the paint like a traditional center. Unlike old school centers, he was skilled enough to attack from the perimeter. He could oh, face wow. and drive all the way to the hole. But wherever he started, Duncan was often grinding closer to the basket with his strength. Because he was a contemporary of Shaq, few people talked about just how strong Timmy was, but he often worked for deeper position and powered into his points. At 260 pounds, he could hold this low position on the block and then swim into a move with force. Notice how he dislodges his defender with his shoulder to create space for the shot. But that's skill, and though. He would lead with his arms on these little half hooks and turning push shots. Watch closely. Like, that's him creating that space. And throws his arms straight up through Ori's left arm into the release. Buggy. This takes great oh, hand strength. So, brother. And turns his off arm into a shield. 
Again, backing down closer. And even though his man is sitting on the shot, he flares that left elbow for protection. That's tough. Like, that's skill. All these deliberate, churning moves require incredible balance and sturdiness. Yeah. He sort of pushes the defender with the ball before going through him, which takes oh, a Velcro so rip. That's and so tough, this bro. technique naturally led to the rip through foul, where Duncan picked up a bunch of extra free throws anytime his opponent's arms were down or when they reached for an exposed ball and missed. Free throws were a big part of Duncan's scoring prowess. His three-year peak in free throw attempts falls in the 98th percentile historically, and unlike Shaq, that served as an efficiency booster since Duncan shot 70% from the line. So much of his scoring was about methodically inching closer to the rim, Occasionally, he'd try that up and under, and sometimes he'd throw in this power spin move where he's squeezing the ball in a vice. You'll notice he was rarely off balance, so when he spins away from the double team, all his weight is over that right leg, which helps him finish through contact. When his avenues to the hoop were cut off, he liked a little turnaround over his left shoulder. And like so many great uh, post scores, shifty, he could also wheel into this same turnaround over his other shoulder. Okay. Although, unlike many right-handed players, it was rarer to see him turn off this shoulder. There's a rip-through attempt again. And I wonder if he was more comfortable shooting these turning left because he could use that off arm to clear out a contesting hand. I'm not an ambi turner. Of course, because it was a Tim Duncan move, he would jab step and fake his way into a little kiss oh, off great. the glass every That's once in a tough. while. Now, where have I seen that before? Bill Watkins bank shot wasn't where they comparing him to him kiss off the glass every once in a while. Now, where have I seen that before? I love Bill Watkins. Man, Duncan's I bank Bill shot Watson, wasn't actually a huge part of his game. He called on it whenever he was facing the basket at an okay. angle like this. But the banker was merely a component of his larger face-up attack, Cash. which involved little pull-ups on the baseline or in the Cash. middle of the floor. How do you, even. Uh, he, who was that? Matumbo? Pull-ups on the baseline or Come in the middle Matumbo. of the floor even. Do better. Duncan wasn't actually a strong outside shooter, making about 38% of his shots beyond 15 mm. feet during wow. these seasons, which landed it. him in the bottom third of the league at the time. I don't know how much more accurate he was going to the bank on these attempts. He was certainly comfortable jab stepping and then playing it off the window, but this was still a flat stroke with a hit. Seriously. Some of these were straight out of the Adrian Dantley school of rhythmic up faking. The shot was threatening enough to open up driving lanes where he could pump fake repeatedly until a defender reacted and then head downhill. There's that strength and body control to take contact from Shaq while decelerating. But it's not strength, though. I don't like that he keeps saying that it. Strength That's not strength. Until a defender reacted and he beat him. And head down him. You know what I'm saying? Like, nothing about strength no. shifted him. You know what I'm saying? There's that strength. He just, he just, it just opened him up. Control to take he couldn't do from shit. Shaq while decelerating. Despite his shooting struggles, Duncan actually had some nice touch on these slow motion rumbles to the rim. He wasn't the quickest, but he was always under control and dexterous enough to flip in all kinds of little shots. His face up game was aided by a tight handle that let him put his head down he and go. Handles? What? He didn't have Not the change really. of direction to unlock a variety of dribble moves but he was secure enough to barrel through players on drives like okay, this. That's we saw a up. svelter Kevin Garnett struggle to hold that line like, last episode. It's fucking me up because it's not like he's like killing niggas though. Like how Shaq would just literally just bulldoze through you. But he did, not, but basically, but most of, his, most of his buckets came from the paint. Whereas with him, it's like he's still working. He, he, yeah, he bodying you up a little bit, but... He still got to use some skill to open up a shot because they on his ass. Like, this is good defense. He was secure enough like, to barrel through players on drive. He's still line. on that. He we just made it. Felter Kevin Garnett struggle to hold that line. And he's right episode. there. All he just of made Duncan's it. high percentage shot attempts and free throws made him a strong playoff scorer during these seasons, stacking up well against most big men historically, wow. save for the best of the very best. Using these playoff numbers, he looks far closer to Olajuwon than to someone like Walton as a scoring hub. But there's a little more to the story. 
When Duncan faced stronger defenses, his scoring wasn't quite as potent, dropping off more than many of the modern greats. Mm. And he had similar struggles in the postseason. He just didn't play many elite defenses, in part because the Spurs were so good. By the way, like Hakeem, Duncan took up basketball later than most. He was a 13-year-old swimmer in the Virgin Islands when he started, and because of that late start, he said he didn't feel he was ready for the NBA after his junior year at Wake Forest, when he would have been the number one pick in the draft. This lack of experience might have been a reason why he started with some fuzzy court vision, but he was always an eager student and willing passer, and in time he figured out what to look for as an offensive hub. Uh. He learned passing reads that allowed the Spurs to stream a ton of their offense through him. They could dump it to Timmy in the post and have him attack help by kicking it to a three-point shooter, or he could wait for the double and find a teammate cutting. This should look familiar. It's the same kind of inside-out offense that we saw with Olajuwon's Rockets and O'Neal's Lakers. Like, just little shit like this. This is what I peep. Like, instead offense, of falling and you know what I'm saying, he advocates for the double. Because he, I thought he was about to spin and go straight to the rim. We saw with but he him. advocates for that bitch and sets up the pass. Now, nah, that's tough. Just look this at just the familiar. shift in his body. He was ready for the spin. He's ready to spin off the same kind of inside Look, out offense that we saw with the last nah, Rockets and O'Neal. It's a little subtle Lakers. shit. On this one, he patiently allows the defense to commit near the baseline. So the basic kick out is open. And man, Gosh. Ginobili made some big plays in 2003. This is the exact same set we just saw. Only the help Shot. comes off the cutter to the corner, so Duncan fires it there nicely for a wide open look. Ah, you bum ass. And his towering height helped him move through these progressions with high quick Let's releases go. when he spotted an open cutter. Okay. He even flashed another Walton move, the little jump pass in tight quarters, creating an even better angle for an express RP ship. Walton. His best, most consistent passes were probably these structured reads from the post to cutters or shooters, and estimates of shot creation peg him slightly behind someone like Kevin Garnett. Velocity helped the big fundamental because he didn't really throw to openings before they emerged. That could have been a touch earlier, and sometimes that made a difference. A key to hitting tight windows is to anticipate movement and here there's a lag and he's not ready to snap it over and by then it's too I'm late. not gonna lie bro when he could see a pass in front of him he could drop some lovely dimes nice. robinson's in his line of sight here and those huge hands make the magic happen Tough. speaking of magic he was a favorite of duncan's growing up and so timmy always wanted to freestyle Ooh, like a guard in transition and there's a johnson inspired look away Tough. he still had blind spots at his peak openings in his periphery right could here. go unnoticed here's another one i mean but at that, that's a risky pass isn't it periphery could. technically i mean could whiz that through there but technically isn't that kind of risky noticed here's another one where the cut starts out Maybe of the corner of his eye but get he's it kind off. of locked into his bank shot dance Sometimes it felt like once he committed to a movement, there was no going back. Damn he starts throwing this fuck. pass without adjusting for the defender, even though his teammate did. And I think Duncan had more of these glitchy looking turnovers than most superstars. Damn. However, slow adjustments don't mean slow actions. And he could certainly map the floor in front of him when he had a second to process it and then move the ball quickly. To my yeah, eye, sure. he was most comfortable with quick reads out of set pieces where he mm. knew what to look for, like in a short roll situation with a teammate in the dunker spot. Hey, ah. He had nice chemistry with Robinson in particular, especially on passes uh. from the top. There was a kind of big to big simpatico with these lobs to the Admiral, and they even ran a little twin tower pick and roll with the court spaced. Unfortunately, but. those were very rare but it wasn't rare for Duncan to hop along with his front court mate, synchronized swimming style. Finally, the big fundamental could snap off some brisk outlets, and he would even try to throw these over the top when the opportunity presented itself, which was a nice fit with smaller players who like to get out and run in transition. I wonder Much how like many Walton assists Blazers, he averaged. Let's San Antonio's Duncan-centric attack. 
Tim Duncan, Tim Duncan, how many assists did he average? Let's see, let's see. During this season, which is 2000 and what, whatever, I think it's early. Wow. He won MVP. He was already fifth MVP his rookie year. Oh my god. Nah, that's low key insane. Wow. It's pretty wild. I'm pretty sure it was this. How many assists? First career three. Okay, so he was a decent passer, though. That's decent for a big man, if I'm not tripping. Tax produced pretty good results, but they certainly weren't a team powered by offense, finishing about two points ahead of the league on that end from 2001 to 2003. Ironically, the 03 title team was one of the weakest Spurs teams of Duncan's prime. Seriously. But a theme of this series is the difference between building an offense around a big man versus a team around a big man. Like Walton, Garnett, and Robinson, Ooh, Duncan's two-way impact made him a superstar. And on those teams, his post-up game was a perfect fit for a defensively slanted that was roster a good move that too. was supercharged by Duncan's paint protection. Because of this, he has some legendary plus-minus stats during these seasons, posting the second largest point differential on record when wow. he was on the court compared to when he was off the court, nice. trailing only his teammate David Robinson from the preceding three years. Wow. Well, Robinson and Duncan reinforced the incredible value nice. of defensive <gasps> studs who are offensive all-stars, it gives me some pause that the top two numbers came from the same team in back-to-back -back periods. There's plenty of noise in 50 games of plus-minus data, and Duncan's surrounding stretches do look drastically different. There were nagging injuries in those following years, but his scoring numbers remain the same. Part of the plus-minus drop-off was probably San Antonio growing less dependent on his offense as players like Parker and Ginobili emerged. The Spurs became a very good playoff offense in the mid 2000s. Duncan certainly wasn't oh. a poor fit. His brand of slower, high viscosity post scoring doesn't scale up that well. Methodical isolation scoring can lift a team's offensive floor, but it's hard to be a great co pilot with that approach. His lack of outside shooting limited some of his off ball value. He could splash in jumpers off a pick and pop, but he just wasn't that efficient on these. He was a far better role man where he could catch and finish through contact near the rim, and he was mobile enough to take a dribble and adjust at the hoop. And this kind of off ball game is a key to blending in on better and better offenses. Ooh, the fake pass. He added more value with his offensive rebounding game, although they were oh. often grabbing his own misses, which was also a byproduct of his power scoring, constantly trying to press forward toward the basket. This is kind of like a lighter version of what we saw from Shaq in episode nine. You can also see how crazy long Duncan is here, barely jumping to reach 10 feet. This overall combination of scoring, shot blocking, and plus minus data gave Peak Duncan some of the best impact metrics on record. And while they might overstate his value, they also drive home how valuable his archetype wow. can be. Where Duncan's low post scoring and play- Very good isolation scorer uses power and length to grind to hoop and spike field goal, I mean free throw rating. Good post passer and outlet passer, better on structure reads to cutters and shooters, off ball value and from rebounding and movement, weak outside shooting and slow style hurt scalability. Playmaking can help weaker offenses reach respectable heights. Well, at this seriously, his creation is seventy three percent. Same time driving them to contention with huge impact on defense, mm. and that same package can turn a solid team into a title favorite, a little bit which lower. is exactly why Tim Duncan's two-way impact gave him one of history's elite paint protector, incredible length, plus good positioning, awareness, and discipline, incredible second contest from a floor-bound approach, excellent sturdy man defender, great drop style defender from length, vulnerable to quickness on outside. Okay, uh, wait. Greatest peaks. Yeah.
Okay, so personally, defending wise, I put KG over him. I'm being 100% honest. KG really didn't have any holes within his defense at all. Whereas Tim Duncan, he just wasn't quick. He was more so, even, I don't know too much about ISO, but it seemed like his defense more so relied on hmm, mistakes. Like mistakes, whether it was a bad switch from the ops, you know what I'm saying? Or he's picking up on somebody. Whereas KG, he could guard somebody 94 feet. Like dead ass. Guard somebody literally 94 feet and get a block on the other end. Not so much with him. And you can tell he, his defense heavily uh, depended on his team as well. It shows. Whereas KG, his defense was the team. Uh, yeah, but that's about it.